My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... But I really want to learn. So... Every week on this show, a classical music expert will give me a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the classical classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the classical classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and here with me in the studio today is Mr. John Camaro Parker. He is a pianist who has been a guest soloist with everyone from the Houston Symphony to the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. He's performed under the batons of many famous conductors, played before royalty and world leaders, and he's played with musical greats from Orly Shaham to Doc Severinsen. He's professor of piano at Rice University's Shepherd School of Music, and in his copious spare time, he is also a recording artist. Mr. Parker, welcome to the show. Thank you. So what are you going to be teaching me about today? I'm going to talk to you about the piano concerto, the act of being a pianist, going on stage with a conductor and an orchestra and performing that repertoire and what it means, what it's about, what happens, all of that. Okay, this is very exciting. Let's let's get going. You're, you're sitting at a piano. I'm pretty excited to hear you play some stuff like five feet away from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you what a, what a concerto is okay. first. Okay, right. A concerto is... Uh, generally a large-scale work. It's a, usually a 30-minute work with three movements that are about 10 minutes long. Mm-hmm. It's very similar to a symphony. The difference is that you don't just have the conductor and the orchestra, yeah. but you have a soloist. And the soloist is either going to be a pianist sitting in front of the orchestra, could be a violinist, a cellist, a flutist, a singer. There, there are a limited number of instruments that work brilliantly well for concertos. And, and by far, uh, piano and violin are the ones that composers turn to most often. And I'd mm-hmm. say probably even the very most often, the piano. So the piano concerto is something that appears very often on an orchestra's concert series. And a guest soloist will be flown in, usually from another city. Uh, They'll be perhaps on a tour performing concertos with different orchestras around the world or around the country, whatever. And you have a very limited rehearsal period, and you go on stage and perform one of these great works. Concertos mostly don't have colorful nicknames, you know, like for piano solo music, you know, we have the Moonlight Sonata and the Appassionata Sonata and, and, and in Beethoven, we have piano concerto number one, <laughs> piano concerto number two, <laughs> but, but actually the piano concerto number five of Beethoven got a nickname. It's called the Emperor. Uh-huh. And uh, because of a, how, how the piece was conceived and, and the possibilities Beethoven was thinking of, of dedication. And, but, and, and of course, the, one of the most famous piano concertos of all is never called a piano concerto. It's called Rhapsody in Blue. And that was uh-huh. Gershwin's first attempt to write a significant work for piano solo plus orchestra. Mm-hmm. Wow. So when you get up on stage and play, what's that like? You're sitting there, they roll out this giant piano onto the stage with, with the orchestra, and you're, and it's just you sitting at the piano surrounded by all of these musicians and, and then an audience in front of you. How on the spot does that feel? What is that like? <laughs> oh, it's really on the spot. <laughs> it, it, when you play a piano concerto, I mean, any concert that you play, you feel on the spot being on stage in front of an audience. Uh But when you play a piano concerto, you're also on the spot in front of the orchestra. Right. They are your professional colleagues. You want to make them feel like you were worth the time (laughs) that that they rehearsed and that that, that they're putting you on some kind of a pedestal in front of the audience. So it's a very big deal to be asked by an orchestra to be a soloist in a concerto. Mm -hmm. And these things are planned very far in advance. It usually happens anywhere from about a year and a half to two and a half years before the concert takes place. Mm-hmm. So it's very much on the spot. My picture is usually in the brochure for the symphony season, mm-hmm. and you feel like, yeah, I, I mean, it's a I'm... a big weight of responsibility. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a big responsibility, and it's very difficult music. It's typically very difficult music. 
it's an interesting experience for a composer. And let's take Beethoven as, I mean, a composer everybody's heard of, mm -hmm. and such a great example because he wrote brilliant music for the piano, he wrote incredible symphonies for full orchestra, and he wrote these five piano concertos. So everything he knew about writing for the piano and everything that he knew about writing for orchestra, he was able to combine into these piano concertos. Mm -hmm. And we would always think of Beethoven as a composer with a very pure artistic intent. Uh -huh. I mean, you see that picture of Beethoven looking gruff, you know, yeah. and, 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 you know, sort of against all odds, including the extraordinary all odds of, of actually going deaf as a composer, he continued to write this inspirationally great music. And so here's a composer with very pure intent that he would want to write music that was all about the art of the music. And yet, when you write a piano concerto, you really do have to feature the piano much of the time, most of the time, not quite all of the time. And you need to showcase the piano in a certain way because an audience expectation in a concerto setting is that the piano will either be featured with the orchestra in the background, or if the orchestra becomes very strong, the uh, piano will start to be like, a, you know, you, you, you end up having sort of protagonists or even mm -hmm. antagonists, you know, yeah. and, and, and there's, there's a little bit, the, years ago I participated in a fun recording with um, Peter Schickley, who's uh, made sort of comedy classical recordings under the alias of PDQ Bach. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and one of those uh, recordings I participated in was called uh, the PDQ Bach Concerto for Two Pianos Versus Orchestra. And <laughs> there is sometimes that sense that the pianist and the orchestra are fighting. <laughs> But, I mean, just to give you an example, the, the Emperor Concerto that I mentioned earlier, the fifth piano concerto of Beethoven, that just starts with a single chord in the orchestra. They just do this. And it's like some kind of a challenge. And uh -huh. then the pianist is expected to meet the challenge with this. And at that point, the orchestra comes in with the second chord, and 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 there it goes, you know. Uh -huh. And there's immediately for an audience this gripping sense of two forces at once mm -hmm. that are clearly going to eventually collaborate. But at first, you it's just, dueling banjos. Yeah, oh yeah, you yeah you absolutely <laughs> sense this this drama between them, no question. Yeah, well, and and speaking of like back and forth and playing in all of these different places, like. Do you actually go and rehearse with the orchestra? Like, and, and if so, how much time do you actually get to spend with them before the performance? The rehearsal process, I think it shocks a lot of concert goers how brief it is. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, I will rehearse twice. Mm -hmm. The first rehearsal will be the day before the concert. And the second rehearsal will be a dress rehearsal on the morning of the concert. Oh, my God. That first <laughs> rehearsal, the day before the concert, generally, depending on the length of the concerto, that rehearsal is about an hour and a half, uh -huh. and maybe two hours. And the dress rehearsal is usually 40 minutes. I mean, it's just enough time to play through the piece. And if something goes desperately wrong, you'll go back and fix it. So... Orchestras paid time is very expensive, mm -hmm. and orchestras have a limited amount of rehearsal time for each program. And if you look at a symphony program and actually look at how many different programs an orchestra like the Houston Symphony plays in one month, you would be just astounded. I mean, week after week, completely different repertoire, in between educational programs with yet other different repertoire, pops concerts mixed in between with classical concerts. It's, it's, it's amazing that they do as much as they do. Yeah. So everything has to happen very efficiently. I mean, we'll prepare a program and we'll perform it from anywhere from a single time to maybe four times at the most. And then I leave town, you know, and, and they move on to another program. So it goes by very quickly. And I get together with the conductor, just the two of us, at mm -hmm. a piano, and I'll sit down and, and start playing. And, you know, I might say something like this. Um, right here. Mm -hmm. 
I might say in the opening of the Grieg Piano Concerto that I'd like the last chord to be just a little bit later, and therefore if the orchestra's coming in at that moment, would it be okay to slightly delay their entry? And so we'll talk about all these tiny little details of, of ensemble and balance and phrasing and uh, general tempo for a, for a movement and work all that out before we rehearse with an orchestra. Okay. Yeah, we work all that out in about thirty minutes. I oh mean, my god! <laughs> <laughs> we usually do it do it during we usually do it during the conductor's lunch break. I mean, he rehearses the orchestra for you know at ten for a few hours and then again at one for a few hours and in the lunch break, I'll run in and we'll sit down at you know either on an upright piano in a dressing room or just anywhere we can find a piano and just quickly go through the piece and say, can we do this? Can we do that? How about this? How about that? Mm-hmm. And uh, make a lot of quick decisions mm-hmm. and then go into the rehearsal. I was I was going to ask that you're a soloist. I'm sure you you do lots of work on your own, where you're sans orchestra and and you know you're accustomed to I'm sure kind of running your own show. And then you get up with the conductor. I was kind of wondering how you know the conductor is, is a, the leader. Like is like it how a does collaboration that work out? Or, yeah. or is it a dictatorship? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it, it really depends. Now uh, I I noticed something in the last few years. Now that I've become a very experienced concerto soloist, a, a seasoned veteran, you might you might say. Uh, when I was younger and starting out, uh-huh. uh, I every conductor I worked with pretty much was older than me, sometimes mm-hmm. by several decades. And I felt very much that I would uh, listen to their experience. You sort of defer. To, yeah, to, and yeah. really defer, exactly. And, and you know, yeah. if they had an idea about something, I'd be a lot more inclined to listen to it. Well, working with conductors, if you're a soloist, is a lot like going to the doctor. Eventually, they become younger than you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so now I'm working with all these conductors who are much younger to, uh, than me, and, and, and I see that they're deferring to me. It's great. <laughs> nice. Know? Yeah, nice. because occasionally you'll come across a, a real, a, a genuine difference of opinion mm-hmm. with, uh, let's say, tempo. Mm-hmm. I, I once did an orchestra tour of Europe with the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. Uh, this is way back when Christopher Hogwood was their music director. And we played 15 cities in Europe in 17 days. Holy moly. Yeah, in, I think, seven countries. It was an, an insane trip. And we played the Beethoven Third Piano Concerto. And about two months later... I was also the soloist with the Toronto Symphony with Gunter Herbig on a tour of Asia, also playing the Beethoven Third Piano Concerto. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a piece that starts with the orchestra for a good minute and a half, maybe two minutes of music before the pianist plays a note. So even though both conductors were very deferential at first about, you know, what's your concept of the piece and how would you like it to go, inevitably over the course of the tour, you know, by the time we got to the sixth and seventh performance, the conductors would start conducting the opening of the piece the way they really wanted it and the way that they felt it. And uh, Christopher Hogwood, with his background in early music and working with a chamber orchestra, really felt that Beethoven Third had a, a fairly light feel. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, Gunter Herbig, with an East German background and with a much larger orchestra, where you can argue that you need a slightly slower tempo just for the for the sound, it was more like this. Yeah. I mean, absolutely heavier, slower, completely different style, yeah. much fuller sound, and. At that point, I thought, well, I could fight with that, which would be ridiculous, and we would have this weird interpretation where there's pushing and pulling and sort of obvious awkwardness, or I could go with it. And I ended up totally going with it and and discovering on the course of those two tours Mm -hmm. that Beethoven is very flexible music. You can have strong feelings about how it should go, and you should have strong feelings about how it should go. But when you're in a situation working with a conductor who has different feelings and they end up getting to express those feelings first, it's much more interesting to go with that and yeah. see what happens. Has there ever been a piece where you didn't feel quite so diplomatic or into the, you know, the uh, experience of learning a piece from a different perspective? Have you ever just said, no, it needs to be like this? Well, there have been times when I've said, I really strongly feel that we should do this 
I would only say that if I felt that I had a good reason. Sure. Like, for example, I'll often ask in places where the pianist is getting drowned out by the orchestra, I'll often ask for the brass instruments to not sustain the notes so much, uh-huh. even though it might normally seem like the right thing for them to do. Uh-huh. It isn't the right thing to do if you're completely drowning out the, the piano soloist. And the brass, who tend to be in the very back of the orchestra, they can barely hear what I'm doing anyway. So they, they really can't tell. They can't be held accountable for whether or not I'm being drowned out. It's really up to the conductor to, to make those things work. And mm-hmm. And I may ask for certain things, and I may insist for certain things, but by and large, in the concert, I mean, I, my feeling is that the rehearsal is the place to state your mind, you know, say your piece, you know, argue for your interpretive way that you want a piece to go. Right. But then the concert is the time to collaborate and just make it work beautifully. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that can take on many different forms. Does it help if you know the conductor, have a relationship with that person? Like, is it easier to work with somebody that you know generally speaking? It's more fun to work with a conductor I know well. Like I I have a a very close friend, Andrew Litton, who's been the music director of the Dallas Symphony and the Bournemouth Symphony in England, and and, uh, we've worked all over the world together. And we feel such rapport Uh that, and we also, maybe most importantly, there's a sense of trust. I know that if I'm going to try a slightly different turn of phrase, maybe a little more rubato in one area, slow something down, you know, something different. It could be that when the hall is full of people, the acoustic is different and it makes me want to do something differently. Whatever it is, I know that he'll be listening and reacting uh-huh. and, and he'll be with me on it and, and bringing a whole orchestra with me on it, which is very difficult for a conductor to do. Uh, but having said all of that, I love working with musicians I've never worked with before. Mm-hmm. I always learn something new. I find it really interesting. And the most important thing for me is, if I'm working with a conductor for the first time, is to try to communicate in rehearsal that they can trust me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> because right. There, so you're there not going to go crazy. Yeah, well, but stage. also there are some weird quirks about concerto playing. I can react at the spur of a moment and play a note a little later than I was going to because I can see and hear and feel that the orchestra is going to be a little later than how it went in rehearsal. But you can't expect 80 people on stage individually to react to me doing something Mm -hmm. differently. They can only play together with me if the conductor is leading them Mm -hmm. in playing together with me. And This brings up one of the weirdest things about concerts, uh, orchestral concerts, that I never understood when I was a kid growing up in Vancouver. And I went to the Vancouver Symphony every week, and I would watch Maestro Akiyama on stage. And I just assumed that when you see the baton go down, that that's where the music starts. And I think everybody kind of has that assumption, the baton goes down, and that's a downbeat, and the music starts there. And it always seemed like the music came later. You know, I would see the baton go down and the music would come a little later. And I was so confused. And I thought, oh, well, maybe the music's supposed to start when the baton goes up. Or, yeah, I just, I didn't get it. And I, it never occurred to me to ask anybody. And so years later, I finally understood the reason for this. And it basically boils down to, and anybody who played, you know, high school band clarinet or trombone will, will immediately get this. When you are playing a wind instrument, mm-hmm and you realize it's time to make a sound, and you see that baton go down, and you start blowing into the instrument, there's a delay before the sound actually materializes. You know, It's right. not like playing a piano. You know, I look at a piano and I just go like that, and my yeah. finger goes down, I play it, and that's, it's very simple. But on any wind instrument, there's all this preparation. You have to have your lungs full, you, you have to make the right embouchure with your mouth and, and, and all that, and you start to blow into the instrument and there is a delay. I mean, these, mm-hmm. many of these instruments are made out of wood and it takes time for the sound to materialize. String players know this mm-hmm. and they don't want to be the first and only person to make a sound <laughs> when, when, when a baton goes down. It's, it's no different from being in you know, first grade and you know, not being the only person standing or something. Mm-hmm. And so everybody plays late to conductors in different degrees, but they basically do it to match the wind players. And so I need to know that. I need to know that a conductor has to indicate the timing of a note mm-hmm. before that note's going to happen. 
and I have to react that way too. Interesting. Yeah, it gets really, really complicated. Um, there's a and the reason we need to develop this trust. There's a place. I don't know how easy, easily I'll be able to explain this, but there's a place in the slow movement of the Tchaikovsky first piano concerto where I have a little solo. And I have one more note, and then the orchestra comes in. And that one last note mm -hmm. isn't supposed to take very long. You know, it's, I... And here's that extra note. I just like that, something like that. Yeah. Well, the conductor, the conductor is going to want to wait for that note and then they're going to start doing that whole thing you see, that slow motion thing with their arms where their arm goes up in the air and the baton's pointing up and then it starts coming down and it's pointing mm -hmm. down. And meantime, I'm sitting there holding this note for a really long time. You know, I could, I could walk off stage, you know, take a shower, come back, I'm still <laughs> holding this note. And then finally I see the strings move, uh, the bows move in the string instruments and I can play the final note. What I always ask a conductor is when I'm almost there, When I'm on the really long note, before I play that penultimate uh -huh. note, start conducting, <laughs> and I'll fit it in, and it'll all work out perfectly. A conductor won't start conducting until they know that they have my attention as well as everybody mm -hmm. else's. So that's where the trust comes in. I have I to see. promise to the conductor in the rehearsals, maestro, I will watch you there. I promise I will watch you there. Because, <laughs> you know, piano soloists sometimes only look at the piano and they get all caught up in what they're doing. And often if I'm playing incredibly difficult stuff, I have to be just looking at the keys. But uh, that's one of those places I don't have to be looking at my hands. I don't have to be looking at the piano. I can be looking at the conductor. And then the whole thing can become very natural and, and very easy. You have to have such sensitivity to everything that's going on around you in addition to playing this really challenging stuff. That's, yeah, it, that's it's remarkable. a very, very different experience from one of my other kinds of experiences, which is playing solo piano music, uh -huh. where I don't have to answer to anybody. And, yeah. you know, in a way that's freeing, but in a way it's bad, you know, because you can get carried away in one direction or another and not have anything to keep you in check. Mm -hmm. And you can go all Michael Jackson. Well, yeah. With you, no people telling you that is a bad idea. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true, actually. And in uh, chamber music, which is the other sort of one third of my musical activity other than concertos and solo playing, mm -hmm. in chamber music, there's a very clear democratic feeling of two people, three people, maybe six people in a group that you're all listening to each other mm -hmm. and you're all, it's all checks and balances yeah. all the time and sensitivity. And, and so concerto playing is, is some kind of ideal mix of those two things. I mean, on the one hand, I'm a soloist and, and, and I get to, to show big stuff and, and do all sorts of glorious things. I mean, even, even the accompaniment in piano concertos is great. Like one of the famous, most famous moments in all of piano concertos. So you hear the horn section uh, and, and the rest of the orchestra and the opening of the Tchaikovsky concerto and they belt this thing out. And at that moment that the pianist comes in, and I'm doing this. Which is one of the moments that people love about the Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto, these big, huge, rich chords coming out of the piano. That's actually the accompaniment, right? The orchestra's playing the tune. They're playing... I mean, that's actually the melody, but everybody really digs the accompaniment. <laughs> it's more <laughs> <Yeah>. fun to play. <laughs> and it's big and loud. Right. Yeah. I would love it, actually, if we could have a brief musical interlude. Can you play a short piece? If you've got anything, I don't know if you if you brought something. That well, you'd I like didn't bring play. anything. I'm just uh, uh, specifically. Uh, let me th okay. let me think about what might be appropriate from. Um, okay. I know what I've got. Okay, Greek. One of the iconic moments of most piano concertos is what we call the cadenza. It's the moment where the orchestra stops playing. Yeah. And the piano soloist, or you know, of course, it could be a violin soloist or whatever, but the soloist plays 
actually solo, you know, without the <laughs> without the orchestra being there. And those are great moments. They're, they're often triumphant moments for the pianist. Uh, they're typically come near the end of the first movement, and they mm-hmm. kind of set up the last few chords of the of, of the first movement. And sometimes they end with a bang. Sometimes they end very, very softly, as in the case of this one, where the orchestra is going to make a reappearance um, in a kind of a dramatic sense. Uh, but here's a moment from the Grieg Piano Concerto, which I uh, gave an example of the theme. What Grieg does in the cadenza is turns that theme, that ti-da-da-dum-ba, slows it way down and adds all this mystery and drama. And then, he, and then he takes that theme and it just explodes. <laughs> Anybody awesome. who just tuned in is going to be saying, wait, 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 the orchestra's supposed to start playing now. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you so much Thank for you. playing that. Well, a final question before you go. We've kind of talked a lot about how this performance and the preparation and everything is experienced from the, the perspective of the soloist. What's the thing that every conductor wants like what what is it that they want if they could have their druthers what would, what would those <laughs> well, be well first of all i think I, a conductor certainly want to have a uh, a seamless experience artistically technically if they're the music director of the orchestra they've got mm-hmm. a much bigger stake in making sure that every concert is a success mm-hmm. if they're a guest conductor they may have had very little input on who the soloist is. So I think there's a little bit more of an understanding that, well, let's just, you know, whatever happens, happens. But if it's the music director and they invite a soloist to play with an orchestra, that's a pretty big deal. That You know, yeah. they're, they're showing a very high level of trust that that soloist is going to be uh, greatly uh, loved by the audience, is, is going to make a wonderful artistic statement with the music, is, is going to be a reliable person to work with in, mm-hmm. in, you know, in every possible sense. Um, within any specific piece of music, I have found that the one thing that conductors value probably more than anything is that you're very clear in how you play so that they really understand exactly where your beat is. Yeah. And there are some famous examples. Like I, I once played the Beethoven Third Concerto with a wonderful Polish conductor, Jerzy Semkow, uh, in Detroit, Detroit Symphony. And uh, I've worked with him before. I mean, he's, he's, he's 
uh, a very serious musician, and uh, he doesn't do anything for extra show or anything like that. I mean, you know, he, he, he takes it very seriously. And I knew that we'd be getting together and talking about the Beethoven before we rehearsed with the orchestra and that we'd be talking about our artistic concept of the piece and, uh, and that he would have some strong feelings about tempo and, and uh, you know, Beethoven's state of mind when he wrote the... I mean, I knew that the, I was expecting all of this kind of stuff. And it turned out that we had very, very limited time together, just a few minutes actually before we rehearsed with the orchestra. He had a, a, an interview over lunch that went over time and we just sort of ran out of time. And he says, you know, I really only need to know one thing. Okay. And uh, I said, what's that? And he says, I need you to play that cadenza in the last movement. And, and it's this place where I'm doing this. And at the moment that I get to that, at that exact moment, the orchestra has to start playing. And that run going up there doesn't necessarily fit into an exact beat pattern. Uh -huh. It's not like one, two, three. It's, it's kind of nebulous. I mean, Beethoven notated it in such a way that, you know, just take exactly the amount of time that you want kind of thing. It's really up to the <laughs> soloist. You know, you don't have to fit it yeah. in. But, boy, conductors want to know exactly where you're going to <laughs> land because if they don't bring the orchestra in in the right place, people generally assume it's the conductor's fault that it wasn't together, you know, and they mm -hmm. look at the conductor like, oh, you can't even, you know, I mean, what, what is this, you know? Yeah. And so they're very sensitive about that. And it turns out sometimes that trumps everything else. I mean, any, any talk of... of uh, I mean, everything else will come up in rehearsal, you know, about tempo and about all the other things that, that you would worry about in a piece, but they really want to know exactly where you're going to place every note because they are responsible for having the orchestra do it with me. Yeah, I imagine that must be like you're sort of herding cats in oh, a way with yeah, musicians. Yeah, because... and of course if you have a very experienced orchestra, they understand and 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 you're working with the music director, uh -huh. they will understand all the signals that a music director gives. I've seen uh, Neme Yarvi uh, as a music director uh, once cue the first violins with his left elbow. I mean, I mean, he just <laughs> poked his elbow up in the middle of things and they knew that that meant something. Wow. Um, but it's very interesting, like for example, take the Shepherd School Symphony Orchestra at Rice. I've worked with them many times, and Larry Ratcliffe is their extraordinary music director. And I see that one of the things he's teaching them is how to read a conductor. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, you know, I'm going to do this. That means do this. <laughs> you <Right. know? laughs> and they start to understand that. And uh, and Larry has that capacity for uh, understanding everything in the score and being responsible for everybody in the score. Mm -hmm. And he has the kind of ability and energy that he can, you know, signal to everybody what they need to be doing. Um, and he's having to be flexible to what I'm doing. I mean, you said mm -hmm. earlier, for me, it must be very difficult to be playing such difficult music and having to be sensitive to the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And But the conductor's having to do the same back to me. And right. ideally, you get to that you know, perfect partnership where it really is like a dance where, where you make the slightest indication of a movement and the other, your, your dance partner knows which way to go. You know? Right. And, you know, and, and when it works like that, it's, it's just magical. You develop a sort of symbiotic relationship yeah. with, yeah. Interesting. Well, John Kamura Parker, thank you so much for coming in and talking about this today. It's been fascinating. And I feel so lucky that I got to see you play. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Everybody, that about does it for this episode. For more Classroom, go to houstonpublicmedia.org backslash classroom, where you'll find an impressive array of ways to listen to us and to engage with us on social media. P.S., you should consider following us on Twitter and Tumblr because we post pics and all kinds of behind-the-scenes stuff that you can't see elsewhere. Also, remember to rate and review us however you access and listen to the show. Uh, send me fun things at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org. Thanks today to audio producer Todd the Tobogganator Holslander for making us sound swell. Thanks to program director Sinjin Flynn for always editing opera in his office with the volume turned up to 11. Thanks to John Kamira Parker for being so generous with his time. Thanks to me for saying words. But mostly, thanks to you for listening. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>